and uh, it will humble you. So that, the yeah. ER is not a place for um, picky goes. Hello, and welcome to the Art of Emergency Nursing podcast. This is where we share stories for inspiration, entertainment, and encouragement, because we all know emergency nurses have the best stories. Now here's your host, Kevin McFarland. Hey everybody, Kevin McFarland here, and welcome back to the Art of Emergency Nursing podcast. Thanks for listening. I appreciate you listening, and I appreciate you sharing this podcast with your friends. I just want to take a minute and read a quick review that we recently got on iTunes. I am so obsessed with you guys. As an ED tech, a nursing student, and a longtime CNA, this podcast has had so many gems. I hope to continue as an ED nurse once I'm finished at school. This podcast has really given me some useful insight. Thank you. Thank you to Megatron86 for leaving that great review. If you haven't done so yet, please get on Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That helps other people find this podcast and lets them know what kind of podcast they might be listening to. I really appreciate it if you can do that for me. This week, I want to share with you a podcast that I've recorded some time ago, uh, but I think you're going to enjoy it. My guest today is a longtime pediatric ER nurse, and now is a full-time stay-at-home mom who spends most of her day keeping her kids out of the emergency department. You're going to really love her stories. Enjoy this episode with my friend, Stephanie. Start off by telling the audience a little bit of who you are, what you do, and a little bit about your background. I guess I should start into like how I even got into nursing, which was very um, not the typical route. When I was a kid, I would never in my life thought I wanted to be a nurse. Um, I was actually in college going to school to become a uh, court reporter, a stenographer. No kidding. And one of the classes you had to take was medical, medical terminology. Yep. And I remember being in that class. And the instructor, she was a retired nurse, and she had stories for everything, like all everything she had. And I just remember listening to her and being so intrigued with it and being like, I I don't want to be in a courtroom, you know, typing this out. Like, I want to I want to do what she's talking about. And it literally from that class changed the direction of how I went in college which is funny because like, I always thought of, you know, being a nurse as being, oh, that's like such a typical woman job. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was definitely not, you know, I'm the tomboy soccer player. I was not going to do that. But, um, yeah. yeah, she changed my direction and uh, never looked back from there. That's Went straight, funny. you know, right into anatomy, physiology, Mike, all that stuff. And, uh, wow. yeah, it was great. And then uh, went to nursing school and obviously just fell in love with what we were doing and my best friend and I at the time um we both knew like we were not wanting to do the typical med surge floor right when you get out of nursing school this is back in like 1995 so yeah it's back when um it was harder to get a job as a nurse unless you wanted to go to med surge yeah there wasn't like new grads to the ICU or to the ER yeah like absolutely not they would never imagine that Right. They would never yeah, imagine no, that. That would never have happened. So yeah. we literally moved from San Diego to Tucson because on spring break, we went out and interviewed at hospitals in Tucson where there was more of a nursing shortage and we were able to get into a telly floor. That's cool. So um, as a new grad, I worked on night shift um, on a telly neuro floor, which um, as any experienced nurse has, there's always one job where you have your cloud. <laughs> and uh, yep. that was definitely that was my hospital where I carried uh, the cloud. Uh, it was night shift. You got between eight and eleven patients. Uh, Cardiazem drips, for car- canamide drips. It was it was an intense floor, definitely. Um, but from there, I went. I moved back to California after I got engaged to my uh, boyfriend and worked in the uh, NICU for a short amount of time, uh, found it was not my cup of tea. It wasn't everything I thought it was going to be. And so after NICU, I wound up falling into PZR and instantly knew this is where I meant to be. That's awesome. So most, most of my time has been in PZR. I've done a-, a little bit of a, you know, a regular adult, adult ER as well, but uh, PZR has been where my thing is. I love PZR. 
uh, as you know, I do, I do PZ, <laughs> PZR casual pull and I love it. And I love where I do it. And I love the people there and I love the, the team and it's just awesome. So it's been, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Exactly. So it's definitely a different world from, from, well, we have that in common, as you know, I, that, that's uh, true. That's true. That uh, Texas Children's Hospital is where, um, that's where it was. And like you said, that was the, uh, as a far as my career, that was the best nursing job I've ever had. That's awesome. And it was based mostly on like the way the doctors treated the nurses and how you were respected as, you know, part yeah. of the collaboration there. That's cool. So how long, so how long have you been a nurse? Since 1995, 1995. Wow, that's so a little while. I don't even count the years anymore. Long time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what do you do now? You're not, you're not working as a nurse now, right? I am not at this time. I, um, I have six kids and they range in age from 21 to five. So tell that I currently, uh, I guess you could say I kind of run the PDR here at the house, keeping was, people I was gonna say out of the ER. <laughs> pri- pri- private duty PZD. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. <laughs> it is. And it's funny how much like everything that you've seen, um, will change your children's lives. Like my children don't have trampolines and yeah. You know, there's certain things that have traumatized you from what you see. Yep. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. T- tell me about a patient that you took care of that changed the way you practice. Um, probably one, I should say she made an impact on the practice. Um, it was a sexual abuse case. Um, it was Ugh. a young girl. She was probably maybe eight. Oh, yuck. And it wasn't really even so much about the case about her. Um, obviously when you have those cases, it's a big family ordeal. Yeah. Um, and I spent a whole lot of time with the mom and the mom obviously devastated to find out that, you know, her eight year old came to her and said, you know, mom, this is what's been going on. It's been going on for over a year. Well, it turns out the person who had been um, sexually assaulting her was her best friend's teenage son. Oh, my. So, yeah. Um, And she had been, you know, repeatedly assaulted. So she was saying, you know, to do the kit, the sexual exam kit, you know, I don't want to traumatize my daughter. Can you can give her some sedation so that she can collect the evidence? And that was not part of what we did. You know, we don't sit, you know, knock out kids to to do the kits. And at the time, it just, it was so hard to, you know, see the mom struggle. She's like, I want the kit because I want to be able to have any kind of evidence that I need, but I don't want to traumatize my child further. And it was such a heart-wrenching thing because even though, you know, all of us, we were trained to do the kits depending on what doctor it was, or even, you know, even the nurse, yeah. it wasn't always done exactly the same way. Yeah. Um, and it was really frustrating for me and that I felt like there was a, some kind of consistency that needed to be done. Like that, you know, it's not fair that we don't have set standards on this is exactly how it goes. And when this situation comes up that we have a way of, of dealing with it. Yeah. And um, it changed things in that I really started looking into on my own, I like, I started calling, um, actually called the St- Texas state attorney's office and got in contact with Jamie Farrell, who was in charge of uh, the same nurses there in Texas. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was like, you know, what can you do to get, you know, how do you get these kind of programs? How do we get training and stuff like that? I mean, we're all trained, we're checked off, we're certified, but you know, there's gotta be a better way for patients and stuff like that. And it kind of sent me on a path, like really talking with management, like, you know, how can we do this better? How can we do that? And I guess it, what struck the chord is it made me realize how much of a voice we have wow. to make an impact on things. Absolutely. Um, so not anything that I specifically did, but um, definitely within a couple of years there, it went from like all nurses are trained and checked off and, and such to they actually got a, a SANE program started there. Nice. So That's awesome. It was nice you know, to be able to see like, you know, the voice 
was talked about, you know, your voice can be heard and it can make a real uh, impact on how things go. Yeah. And I certainly feel like sane nurses are far more qualified um, to handle really complex situations like that where um, there's a real ethical dilemma, you know, in how to do something. Yeah, that's, that's like their wheelhouse there. <laughs> they do that every day. Yeah, it, that's crazy. It, it is. You know, and even kind of feeding off of that, though, you know, it really made me start to realize at that point, I was like, well, you know what, I really want to just look into um, like the ENA and becoming a CEN. And I started like, you know, I got a CEN book and I started looking through it and I'm like, you know, I just I don't have any adult experience as far as like in the ER. So I felt very like if even if I had passed the test, like that wasn't a true, I was like, I wouldn't even really be able to say, you know, how can I have this certificate when I've never worked PD and an adult ER? Yeah. Um, and so I again started like making calls to the people over at ENA and the beat, you know, and saying, listen, can you guys maybe recognize that pediatric emergency room is kind of a subspecialty, you know, of nursing. It's not the same. Like, like here you have, there's definitely across the country, hundreds of hundreds and thousands of nurses who work in pediatrics ERs, but we don't have a test, you know, specific to pediatrics. Yeah. And uh, they were like, well, you know, we don't know if we have enough need for that at this time and stuff like that. And um, it actually got me, you know, inspired to start going into the local ENA. And so I nice. started going to the local Houston ENA chapter and, there was no peds nurses in there at the time. And so um, I started attending and then, you know, I started telling people about it at work and, you know, Hey, you know what, when you, you know, want to make an impact, you know, this is a good place for us to go and talk about things that need to change and, you know, stuff like that. And, uh, and then our, like our nurse educator started going to um, Cindy Jenkins. She was at the time and uh, she's brought along another one of our friends, uh, Dana Breacher, who, down the road is, you know, now boy, she's a she, boy. She took the ENA. president of ENA. She took the ENA thing and ran with it. Didn't she? <laughs> I didn't know she, she I, did. I guess, I, I guess I didn't know she had been in Houston. Yeah. So. Yeah. We were the, it was working with us there at Texas children house. She got introduced. Uh, she was, uh, she and Cindy were pretty good friends. And the, the three of us used to go there and, and uh, gosh, made lifelong friends there. That's awesome. Through Houston ENA. And, um, how cool is that? You know, it was really fun to watch how um, definitely intense, you know, like the Texas state ENA stuff, even going to the state level meetings. I mean, uh. that takes it from a local meeting, which can be pretty casual. But when you start going to the state meetings and stuff and seeing how, I mean, things are run, you really feel like you're in a political environment there. Uh, which it was awesome. You know, it was awesome again to see like, you know, this is where real change can it's gonna come in your numbers and where you have the voices that can be heard. And DNA is definitely one of them. Yeah. The so. state, the state meetings are kind of funny. They're, they're a complete different level of intensity. You know, I spent most of my time in New Mexico where our state meeting was, you know, more like a chapter meeting. Cause it, you know, that's about how many people we had. Um, but boy, the the Texas meeting was a whole other bag when I first went. I was like, "Wow, this is different." So it was great. Yeah, it was good. So you talk about things being bigger in Texas. That's uh, the DNA <laughs> falls right in with that. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. That is absolutely <laughs> absolutely true. So absolutely. What's the best advice a nurse mentor ever gave you? Um, you know, one of my best mentors. Um, I'm not going to say it's any advice that he gave me, but it was things that I picked up watching him. Um, I'm definitely a very visual learner. So he was somebody who was like my, oh, I want to grow up and be a nurse like him. And That's watching awesome. how he would interact um, specifically, you know, with the kids with impedes. Uh, um, the parents were furious and, you know, and, and you know, somebody would get down here, down here. And to watch like how Dan would come into a situation that literally felt like you were walking into a war zone and he just, he would walk in and he'd have confidence and calm and like kid could be laying there and he would, 
he would lower the bed, you know, he'd sit, get a chair and sit down next to the kid and he would talk with him and he had his own little private stash like of stickers. And he'd be like, you know, help me pick out a couple of stickers here and we're going to stick to, you know, we're going to put them on your, your little band aid that's going to go on your arm and like how he would get the kid involved in the procedure and be like, you know, I'm going to talk you through this and stuff like that. And he was the kind of nurse who could literally like, he could start an IV, you know, in a piece of lettuce. <laughs> so he was so awesome with his technique, but I think some of it, it was more than just his technique and getting the IV was the ability to take a stressful situation and just bring it down. Yeah. Um, Boy, that is a skill, so, you know, doing things like sitting down and talking with somebody and learning how to, you know, really involve the kid. And when you see the kids start to become at ease, it just diffuses the parents. Like parents can't be all stressed out when you got a kid who's been stressed out and is now calm. Yeah. So those are some of the most valuable skills I've learned from him. It's just how to be able to walk into t- complete chaos and just like pop the bubble of it and diffuse it. <laughs> That's awesome. That is definitely a skill. And that's a, a skill that if you can learn that you can bullshit your way through a lot of other stuff, but you just can't bullshit your way through that. Um, that's a, that's definitely a skill <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So and I will say, you know, even with adults, you know, the fact the the ability to just take a chair and pull up right at, I mean, we don't, it's an ER. It's hard to have the time to do it, but it saves so much of the headache and it takes so much of the stress level down Yeah. that I definitely got into a habit of, you know, like just pulling up a chair. Okay. Tell me what's going on, you know, and, and being eye to eye instead of, you know, being above them looking down, makes there's something a, about having that eye to eye contact. It makes a big difference. It really makes a big difference. And that's one of the things I try to teach people all the time is just that one little act of just getting down to their level, seeing eye to eye. Um, sometimes it's enough to, to make a bad situation so much better. So that's cool. It is. It is. That's cool. It's a yeah. definitely a great skill for an ER nurse to have is just that ability to just kind of bring the calm wherever they are, whatever they're doing. That's a, that's a skill for sure. Yeah. So it's amazing. What is like a new nurse or is a, you know, a, a inexperienced nurse. Like you pick up on all that stuff. You watch everybody. You watch everybody do their stuff. And if you pick somebody who you're like, okay, I like their style and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to emulate that a little bit, that goes a long way. What advice, what advice would you give a brand new ER nurse? Just starting in the ED for the first time. What, what advice oh, would you give? Um... Probably one of the first things I've always make sure when I used to be do precepting is to make sure that they are able to pick out resource people. Um, obviously not just, you know, me as the preceptor, but, you know, know who your go-to people are, like not just when you're on orientation, but like every single day and yeah. know who your strong people are and who you can come to and depend on. Yep. Um, because, you are definitely going to come into situations where you're way over your head and you've got to know who's the, who's the person who is, you know, approachable and somebody you can go in and, and um, who's going to have your back. Who's going to be the lifeguard. It's going to be able to scoop you up. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and I mean, that's something even as you get experienced, you know, you still like, who's your go-to person when, you know, Oh my gosh, something's about to crash here. You you know, you're going to need backup. You're always going to have to, be able to pick out who who you want to have be standing by your side during something that's going on. Yeah, that's cool. Um, one of the other things um, I uh, almost had a bad situation and had to learn the hard way was to always be aware of your surroundings. Um, I did one of my first adult ER that I worked in. Um, it was on a night shift and it was like two in the morning and had this guy come in he was intoxicated so bad and he was in a really small room and he's probably like six five three hundred i mean huge guy and then there's me and i went to i don't know something by the sink and he got between me and the door oh wow and, uh, i felt very very vulnerable he started you know he was kind of half wobbly and he was taking his pants down because he's like, I need to pee. And he was like, literally like trying to pee on me. Yeah. Um, which is 
not not great but I was like okay I felt like you know what if he had come at me like I would have not I wasn't able to reach you know like the code button like if I would needed help I wasn't able to reach it at that point I wasn't able to reach the door so I was like I felt very very vulnerable so like after him uh, thankfully with the commotion that had been going on, there were people that heard it and it was close enough to a nurse's station. But I've worked in many ERs where you're around a corner and you still might be on phone. You've got, you know, like patient or somebody who's on drugs or intoxicated. Um, you can get yourself in a really compromised situation if you're not um, really aware of your surroundings all the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, there's so many, and... there's so many cases like that where you're like going, Holy cow, if I just wasn't paying attention, I could have really got myself into trouble. And even sometimes when you are paying attention, yeah. you still can. That's crazy. Yeah, luckily I had, um, like I said, people were able to come in and help, you know, kind of help restrain this guy down and stuff like that. But um, it could have been. Thank God. It was the, the first time I actually felt really scared. <laughs> like, wow. oh my gosh, I could actually really get hurt here. Holy cow. Um, and one of the other things I always told the new grads was to, um, to keep a journal. And when you're new, because especially like as you go on and you have times when you're starting to burn out and stuff like that, sometimes kind of going through and like, especially like keeping a journal of, it's easy to remember the hard things or the really bad cases. Those unfortunately tend to plant seeds in our head, but it's harder to remember the ones that, um, you know, the wins that you had, like, man, I had a really good shift today Um, or, you know, how you helped somebody else out and to be able to reflect back on those times, like as you start to experience more of the burnout, um, I thought that always helped. But, I mean, I was always a journal or type person, anyway, yeah. but it's good to like reflect back on, you know, things like that. And, um, you know, back in the days when I first started working, we had patients who would actually um, like write letters to the hospital. And so like in the hospital made a routine of, of giving them to you. So like, I still have, certain letters from patients, you know, wow. that, you know That's thank crazy. you so much. You made such an impact on my life, you know? And so to have those kind of things to be like, yeah, you know, this is, this is still why we do this. There's, you know, there's good days. Heck yeah. I think, and that's kind of, I think that's one of the goals with this podcast is to be able to have something that people can like listen back to and be like, okay, that would be cool to have happen. Okay. That would be a cool scenario or, or, Hey, you know, I want to do that. I want to, you know, I want to, I want to be able to say that sometime that I, that I helped save this life, right? You know, I helped be involved in this case that, you know, you'd be able to say that years later, you know, it's to be able to go back and be like, oh, okay. Nice little warm, fuzzy file to make you feel good about, you know, all the things you've done. That'd be cool. Yeah, so. it is. It's, it's neat to look back on. That's cool. That's really cool. And uh, probably one of the last, other last of those things I always tell them, um, is to make sure that they're taking all the opportunities to learn, not just from me, but like um, I always try to get them to like go in with doctors when they do their assessments and, you know, figure out like each doctor who has their own little quirks and likes things certain ways and stuff like that, that um, lots of times it's real helpful to be able to communicate with the doctors when you know the things that they look for and how like they like to do their assessments and stuff like that. So, Absolutely. You know, that our assessment skills are, are how we are, but you know, everybody's got their own little quirks and things that they like and how they like, you know, like uh, we always had one patient in particular, a doctor in particular who it didn't matter if the kid came in for, you know, a stub toe, she wanted that kid in a gown undressed. She was going to do a head to toe assessment. I mean, and if you didn't, she would rip you right, <laughs> literally right in front of the parents. Yeah. So, like, to learn all the little quirks about everybody and what they need and what they like. And, you know, it helps you develop your own assessment skills, too, which obviously is our, to me, that's our greatest tool. Absolutely. More so than the monitor. Yep. Oh, 100%. I always tell people that, you know, don't pay attention to the monitor. Pay attention to the patient. Here's how the patient looks, <laughs> you know, because that's what matters. Yeah. So, and I think sometimes yeah. nurses forget that. Definitely. So that's crazy. Have you ever witnessed a miracle? Ooh. I would say that that happens all the time. It's just harder to pick up on the miracles that happen. Um, you know, the turnout for the good. Yeah. Um, 
more I, for sure there's patients who have come in. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but you're like, there's just no way they're going to survive. And actually, I guess in some ways, this is, this one was a miracle. Um, again, in pediatric ER, we had, it was a relatively actually quiet morning. And in our ambulance bay, somebody came barreling in in their private car. And the door flew open, and we recognized it as one of our local pediatricians. So, of course, as soon as you see a pediatrician jump out of his car, you're like, oh. This so is going to be bad. <laughs> you see him go around. He, <laughs> yeah. He went around and he went to the other side and he grabbed the baby out of um, the mom's arms and just left her behind and just literally ran up through the bay up to the ambulance thing and came in. And we obviously we took the kid right into our crash room. And it was a little girl. She was probably about three, clearly having uh, meningitis. She had the rash. She, she looked like the walking death. Wow. And he said, I had to drive her here myself. Um, just so you know, the mom's going to come in and she's probably going to tell you not to do anything. She is, um, she's no vaccines. They don't believe in medical care. They've been trying everything at home to get her better, but she just hasn't been getting, getting any better. So she bring, bring him to the office and he's like, I the kids dying in front of my eyes. I had to just literally put him in the car and come here. Yeah. And, you know, she came in behind and she was actually relatively calm. And she was like, you know, she starts putting the, you know, the leads on the child and getting ready to start an IV. And she would be like, no, I don't, I don't want an IV. I don't want an IV. And, you know, we were putting oxygen on her and luckily our medical director was there. And she literally like, she just pulled the mom aside and she's like, I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't step out of the way and let us do our job, you're going to be taking your daughter home. You know, she's going to be going to the funeral home. Your daughter is dying in front of our eyes. There's wow. like no doubt about it. She has bacterial meningitis. She is dying in front of her eyes. And she just finally started crying and she, she sat down and she let us do our thing. I mean, we had to intubate her. Um, she went up to ICU. I don't, I don't remember if she coded or not, but I know like she was really touch and go there for at least a couple of weeks. And she wound up having um, a couple fingers and toes amputated but she survived oh, and no. I can remember the mom coming back down to the ER at the time when it was time to go home, you know, and she actually did come back down and thanked us and said, you know, thank you for saving, saving my kid's life. What an amazing and feeling. To me, that's just, it's one of those situations where, you know, and again, I know there's so much controversy with the whole vaccine thing, but it's, there's still going to be, it's that's not going to go away. We're going to have to find a way to be able to communicate with them and, you know, understand where they're coming from and still be able to do the best that we can. Yeah. And, you know, obviously when a kid was crashing, it wasn't time to, you know, point fingers or get into anything like that. So, but um, she definitely, you know, I've seen plenty of other meningitis cases come in where they didn't survive. So to me, it was definitely a miracle that this one as sick as she was when she walked in the door. Um, she managed to, you know, come out of it, not dead, but, you know, losing a couple of fingers and toes, but really a child who probably should not have survived. That's, that's crazy. Holy cow. One of the last questions I always ask people is I always ask people, people a question called three things. And it's three things that an ER nurse should remember and three things that an ER nurse can just go ahead and forget. <laughs> um three things an ER nurse has to remember. They'll probably be different than most of them you've had before. Okay. Um, to me, number one, you better have a good pair, of, but good pair of shoes. Yes, indeed. You better have a good pair of shoes because your feet are going to pay. They're not going to be the pretty shoes, the cute shoes. They're just the ones that where your feet don't hurt after being up for 13 after. to 14 hours. Right. Um, yeah. The other thing that you have to have is a support person to vent to. Um, if you're like me and it's not somebody that's your spouse because they don't work in medicine and they don't understand your stories or how you can do what you do, um, you got to find somebody who you can vent to when you've had the day where you just you need to let it go to somebody who can yeah. be not judgmental or you know tell you how can you do your job and stuff. Somebody yeah, no, I understand can be there that for you. I understand that for sure. So. <clears throat> And the third thing yeah. to remember? And, uh, the 
third thing is you got to have a higher power. You got to have something so that on those cases where you're like, I did everything right. There's no way that patient should have not made it or, you know, um, that you have something that you can cling to, to know that ultimately this is not in our control. We can do what we can do and we can do the best that we can do. And ultimately it's still not under our control. Very few things, uh, not very few, but there's a lot of things that aren't. And, and those are the times that, that can, can really sometimes test our faith. So that's, yeah. uh, that makes it tough. Yeah. You know, you're sitting there thinking, okay, how could, how could a higher power have this happen? It doesn't make sense. Yeah. So it does. And, you know, I can remember, um, mine was certainly, I mean, most of my time in the ER, I did not have any, um, I believed in a God, but I was like angry. I was like, how could, how could God give kids cancer? How could kids be abused? And the things that I see here, how could this ever happen if there really is a God? Yeah. And um, mm. there, you just have to have a way of being able to, to let all that, let it go. Yeah. And know that you're, it's not you're ultimately right. something you have the control over. Yep. You're absolutely right. So, um, and things to forget. Um, you better forget that you that you will ever be or hear it all because the day you say I've seen everything is the day something's going to come and kick in the butt. <laughs> right. Ain't that the truth? Every single time, every single time you get a little complacent, you're like, man, yeah. no big deal. You're like, Oh crap. Yeah. You will never see it all ever. Um, forget, leave your ego at the door. You cannot come into this place and, and uh, it will humble you. So bet, even yeah. ER is not a place for um, piggy goes. No. And the last thing, um, white scrubs, please. <laughs> they just need to be a thing gone forever. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I've, I've never worn white scrubs and, and, and hopefully never will. So. Yeah. We had them in nursing school and that was, we were so happy to be. Yeah. For those who are gone. With, them it doesn't matter yep yeah that's funny yeah what's your go-to so someone says Mm -hmm. oh someone says oh you were a you're an er nurse um what's your you know what's the craziest thing you've seen or what's the what's your go-to here let me give you an example of the er kind of story that that you you know (laughs) They always ask. They always ask for it. Like, well, what's the worst thing you've seen? And like, you don't even want to hear about that because it's terrible. But here's this. What's your yeah. What's your go to story? Yeah. My go to story is usually one they regret that they've asked, um, and it's one that most of us who've worked in the ER have seen. Um, mine is at the scream of somebody at triage um, that you can tell because they have a roach in their ear and it may be more specific down here to the South where we have roaches. And I can honestly say it was one of the things that was the first time I ever saw it. I was just floored to like, see, look in somebody's ear and literally see like a live roach trying to burrow itself in somebody's ear. And, uh, you know, most of the time they don't know exactly that that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So there's just, just there's a bug in my ear, but like as soon as they hear, you know, it's a roach in your ear, the, the meltdown, that scream. Uh, oh, I, so uh, yeah, uh, I tell people, you know, especially in the south here in Florida, it's not like the ones in your house. It's not like that. It's usually the palmetto bugs, and it's around dusk time, and they're usually outside by palm trees. And I'm like, so you know, if you ever outside, you kind of like feel like a bug has gone by your ear, you better like put your fingers in there because just check <laughs> i can't even tell you i've so many times to- i've pulled more roaches out of people's ears than i care to even count oh and uh, it's just the worst it's just one of those like, like what? You're, what you're like oh my god what? why would a roach go in your ear and i'm like they i don't know i don't have their minds i just know that more than anything in somebody's ear it's a roach being pulled <laughs> out every now and then a wasp yeah but uh there's something about those nasty roaches. <clears throat> yep. We had a girl come in and she's screaming at the top of her lungs. 
and she's slamming her head up against her her um face uh she's slamming her her hand up against her ear and she's like get it out get it out we're like what's in your ear and she's like i don't know there's something in there it's moving around and we're like ew so the the doctor looks in there and he's like he you know he just kind of half ass looks and he's like i don't see anything yeah come back tomorrow um but then they look again and they're like oh look look what look what that is that's a bug that's not good and you know it is like instant hero when you pull it out though <laughs> you're like you get it out yeah. and you're like oh instant hero so yeah those are the worst uh, Ugh. yuck yucky they are they so. are the worst and then they like i said it's like you're telling the story and all people can do is just like cover their ears they're like no 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 I'm like yes there's yep. certain you know, there's certain walks people have when they walk it. You know, you know when somebody's got a kidney stone, <laughs> when somebody's coming in with a heart attack. Yeah. And then there's that scream of "There's a bug in my ear." That yeah. It's a certain pitch of scream that you know. Yep. For sure. For sure. Thanks for listening to the Art of Emergency Nursing podcast. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Facebook. Hey everybody, Kevin here. I just wanted to give you a quick reminder about the Southeastern Seaboard Emergency Nursing Conference that's coming up at Myrtle Beach, March 30th through the 1st. A lot of the people who have been guests on my podcast are going to be speakers at this event. Gene Prale, Jeff Solheim, Patty Howard, the ENA president, Mike Hastings, they're all going to be there. Yours truly is going to be there as well, and I am looking forward to meeting you if you're there as well. So if you get a chance, come on down to Myrtle Beach and I would love to meet you. I'm going to be doing a little bit of podcasting while I'm there just to keep myself out of trouble and hopefully I'll see you there. Thanks a bunch. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Don't forget to leave us a rating and review. Have a good shift.